Welcome to my session on building reusable websites on Drupal 8. Can anyone, anyone hear me fine in the back as well? No? All right, let's see. <laughs> can, can you hear me now, if I speak a bit louder? Perfect. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, lessons learned of transforming rednoseday.com. Um, first of all, who am I? Um, my name is Peter, um, and I've been a long-time Drupal contributor. Uh, probably f uh, for more than 10 years I've been involved with, with Drupal. Um, and I'm kind of wearing two hats. Um, one hat is I'm tech lead at Comic Relief, uh, which is a major charity in the UK. And the other hat I'm wearing is I'm a founder of Marzi Labs, which is uh, a small uh, web development agency originally from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, with offices as well in, in Portugal. Um, a little bit about Comic Relief. Who in the room does not know Comic Relief? All right, so many people actually know Comic Relief, and that's probably because Comic Relief also exists in uh, the US. Um, but I'm speaking here on behalf of the UK team of uh, Comic Relief. Um, which is a major charity in the UK. Uh, we raised about uh, over one billion pounds in, uh, since, the, since our existence in 1985. Um, money that we spent uh, to tackle the root causes of poverty and social injustice. We do that mostly um, by organizing two main fundraising campaigns, um, Sport Relief and uh, Red Nose Day. And you might be fami familiar with Red Nose Day because Red Nose Day is coming up as well in the US, uh, end of May uh, on NBC. So obviously, I'm here to talk about Drupal, right? So um, we've been using Drupal at Comic Relief since 2014 and even before that. Uh, when we ported over our main web presence, comicrelief.com, um, to Drupal. Now, we're doing these fundraising events year by year. So in 2015, we, we started working on, on our 2015 uh, Red Nose Day campaign, uh, where we chose for multi-site, um, basically because we wanted to reuse the same code base that we set up for uh, comicrelief.com. Now, when we uh, started in our 2016 campaign for Sport Relief, we wanted to, again, uh, reuse the same code base. So we thought, OK, we have this multi-site setup. Let's continue. Let's put another site on our multi-site setup. And um, as probably most people in this room know, multi-site um, is not really a good idea. Um, you start, <laughs> at some point you feel like giving up, right? <laughs> so um, the reason is that uh, basically you're, you're, you're stopping yourself to innov inno innovate from the start by combining code bases from different projects all together and um, not allowing you to actually change one thing and having it affect all the other sites that you that you that run the same setup. So, when we, we started our Red Nose Day campaign for 2017, uh, we started differently. We wanted to build a platform, uh, a product, um, to power all our editorially controlled websites. It's a very very different thing to think about something like that than to build a website. We don't want to build a website. We want to build a product to power all our campaigns that are coming in the future. And we want to really focus on three main components here, three, three main streams of work that I think are vital to build such uh, products. Um, the first one uh, is the editorial experience. Editorial experience is very, very important because we want to build a tool that allows our editorial team to build a compelling website, right? With different landing pages for our different audiences. But we also want to make sure that we automate this process and we streamline this process. We want to make sure that we build a product that we can iterate upon with a semantic versioning system behind it so we can actually know which website runs which version of the code base. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about decoupled services. and. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you if I'm not going to be talking about headless Drupal. 
Um, because I think there's many different ways to decouple services uh, that are not currently touched upon by headless uh, or, or, or by existing ways to kind of decouple um, different parts of the system, right? And finally, um, not surprisingly again, our technology choice here uh, will be Drupal, specifically Drupal 8, which is a very different kind of system from previous versions of Drupal. Um, I think it's also important to say that I'm not going to really be talking about what, how we use Drupal or what, what modules to use and all this kind of stuff, but rather how to position Drupal to build a stable product. So first of all, um, let's start with the uh, editorial experience. This is a sample uh, website, a sample page, where you can see different components um, being used to make a landing page, right? So we want to build a site that can power these kind of pages. To do so, we didn't start this process directly in Drupal. We didn't want to be kind of bogged down by Drupal uh, Drupal's code base, database, all these kind of things to develop these components. So we started with our pattern lab. This is very, uh, this is very hot right now as well in the community where people are talking about uh, component-driven design. Well, that's very important for us and I think for many websites. Um, in this case, we started kind of dissecting our page into patterns. Um, examples would be like a quote block or uh, an email sign-up header, and kind of positioning this into a pattern lab. Um, for this, we use something um, that's called KSS, uh, now style sheets, which is sort of a documentation syntax for CSS. The, the good thing is that um, this can now be tested. We can develop these components in isolation. And we can actually link them, and I don't know if you can see that at the bottom, there is an actual tweak template that relates to the, to the CSS and to the display that you see on top. And that's reused later on by our Drupal instance. This kind of leads to what we call our pattern lab driven development. So when we start building our components, we come up with an idea, let's say a code block. We start building this code block inside the pattern lab just using HTML, uh, SAS, and JS, if, for example, there's some, some interactivity to it as well. And then we kind of iterate over this until we're happy. We do a series of review, pro uh, review um, processes, multi-device, uh, QA, sign-off, all these things can happen without you having to do that within the Drupal site. That's a major win because this process is so much faster and then we move on to the Drupal development stage where we're gonna work on our content model, our view modes, um, put all this logic inside a component module and work on the tweak uh, and potentially some pre-processing in, in PHP before it's shipped off to the final product, the final site, where then the editorial team will take this on and start reusing this on all their different pages. Um, some things about the previous slide as well is um, you can actually do that in, 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 you can start sharing this pattern lab with non-Drupal sites as well. So within an organization, you can build a pattern lab um, that's generic and that all the sites can plug into and reuse the components they wish to use. Uh, we're currently in the experimental phase with that, uh, packaging up our pattern lab as an NPM module. So how do we connect this now to Drupal, right? Um, so how do we, what, what do landing pages, how do we build these landing pages in Drupal? And we went through a series of iterations to kind of get to where we are now. And our first iteration has been panels with Panelizer, which is a very flexible approach to build compelling landing pages. However, it's, it's a little bit like a hack because Panelizer kind of ties the power of panels into a node, right? It, it, it feels it's a great solution, but 
it's too flexible and it sort of feels like a hack. Our second iteration then used the same thing, but we started to use the paragraphs module within that panelized node. This, <laughs> this worked a lot better. This worked so well that we actually didn't need panels anymore at all. So our third iteration was paragraphs. Yeah. <laughs> and, and paragraphs is a fantastic module. Check it out if you haven't. It's, I think it's revolutionizing the way we do content, content entry, and we build complex pages. And we kind of extended this, not really extended, but we use block reference a lot, because the difference, um, a lot of the things we need to enter in these landing pages are not necessarily content, such as an email sign-up form or something that has some um, custom actions added to it. So for this, we use a block reference paragraph type that can kind of pull in blocks um, in, in, in the paragraph node. This is kind of how, how the system looks like, very simple. Um, all powered by Contrib, no custom code required at all. Um, we have our, our nodes with our different paragraph types. Um, main thing to know is paragraphs are not reusable. So if you want pieces of content that you can reuse on different pages, you might want to structure this into what we do, what we call our library of blocks. And now you can just pull them in through, through parag to our paragraph types again. And this is how you can kind of give a lot of flexibility, but don't compromise on the editorial experience. All right, that's, that's the first part. <laughs> the second part, I think that's very important when you build um, a product, is you need to focus on automating and streamlining everything. This is, is something very, very important that you need, and that is you need to make your build in one step. It's part of Joel Spolsky's original test um, for, for building good software systems. Um, and you need to make this build in one step. How do we do that? Well, we package up our websites um, and our components using an installation profile. So basically build a distribution. Might sound very familiar to many of you, right? And we use the fantastic CMI in Drupal 8. We kind of slice up our config ourselves manually with config devel, so we know exactly what goes where, and we don't have this monolithic blob of configuration. Default content uh, has been talked about before uh, in the keynotes. Very important, because when we ship our product, we want to ship it with default content, so we can, developers can do something when they extend the functionality. We can do QA, uh, we can do automated testing, all reusing that default content. And, and finally, um, you, sh you should use a build tool. Uh, we used to use Thing, which is like a PHP build tool, very powerful, but recently we're, switched, we're switching over to Composer, uh, which feels more native to the projects, as well as all the latest changes that went in Drupal 8 core that help you use Composer. If you haven't used it, check it out. Composer is, is fabulous. It's, it's, it's so much better than what we had before with Drush, and rush make and uh, all these kind of things that feel always felt a little bit um, like they weren't native to Drupal. Finally, um, we also need to think about tests, right? Because if you build that product, we need to automate everything using tests. So we do a whole series of checks, um, code quality checks, um, configuration checks, to make sure that configuration is in the right place. Um, distribution installation tests. Every time a developer would commit a new piece of code, you want to make sure that you can reinstall your site. That's not something was broken. And then you need to look at behavior tests. Like you, you want to use a tool like Behead to simulate the editor going through the site and adding all these type of landing pages that you've just been developing. After you've done that, you can check the locks, the Drupal locks, for example, to see what locks, what errors have been generated through this uh, behead process. That's a very nice way for you to make sure that um, all these uh, errors you would otherwise see in production are caught at a much earlier stage. 
and the last thing that, that I think is quite important and, and often sort of forgotten is visual regression tests. Every time you make a change to your front end, you want to make sure you understand the impact of that change. So you need to have some way to check this. And we're using uh, BBC's rate tool. Um, there's a couple of other tools out there as well. I don't think it's receiving the right amount of attention. Um, so I hope this will change in the next, uh, the next months or so. Finally, of course, automation is nothing without some sort of continuous integration behind it. So we use Travis, Travis CI. It's a fantastic tool uh, because you can spin up basically a new instance on every commit on Travis uh, infrastructure and we run through all our checklists and the builds basically will fail when any of these things fails. It's direct feedback for a developer, uh, especially when you use something like uh, the Gitflow model and you make pull requests. Um, you can actually see the state of code and understand how things are affected uh, by what exact action. Then the last thing that is kind of important to our um, setup, let's say, are preview branches. Um, preview branches basically on every commit to the code base built a site for you. And we use the service of the fantastic service of Platform Message, uh, which can spin this up very easy for you, very cheap, and also directly give you feedback within the pull requests. Um, if you haven't worked in such a setting, it's, it's really great because it, it allows you to follow the changes uh, as they happen to the code base. And then I come to my third part uh, that I think is very important when we're developing a product, which is you want to write better code and you want to use something like the coupled services. Um, Again, I'm not going to talk about headless, um, but I think decoupled services are, are part of our microservice uh, infrastructure ecosystem. And there is many ways to do um, these kind of things in the land of Drupal. Um, but first, better code. Has anyone seen this slide before? <laughs> Feels slightly familiar when you work on a Drupal project. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is the more code you add to your product, to your code base, the more errors you're going to see um, times two. <laughs> so we want to minimize the custom code, right? We want to make sure we only add the right amount of code to our code base. And actually, we went through our current code base as, as, a, as a kind of a test. And I found just around 2,000 custom PHP lines in our distribution. Basically, this PHP, um, code, uh, these PHP lines were re relating to option callbacks, custom display suites, uh, fields, uh, solar tweaks, all these kind of things that you would call glue code when you do a Drupal project. All the non-glue codes, on the other hand, we tried to contribute this back to a specific module. So we needed a really good reason to do something, um, to do glue code, in fact. Because if we could refactor it into a module that can be contributed, that's the way forward. Because then we can plug into the community to help maintain this code. And let me now talk um, about kind of the two patterns I see uh, for doing decoupled services in, in Drupal. Uh, the first one might seem very obvious. Um, basically, we call it the embed pattern, and we use iframes. Before you say iframes are bad, don't use iframes. Uh, you see iframes everywhere. If you, if you see uh, a tweet embedded within a New York Times article, chances are that tweet is coming from an iframe. So iframes are very much used on the web every day. So basically, we make this easier within our CMS by allowing the editor to add iframes from other sites. An example here is a kid's game we developed for our younger audience. 
um, that is developed um, in a different framework. It's a front-end uh, game using all kinds of 2D, 3D rendering techniques. So we just embed this on, from a different URL in our website and kind of surround it with editorial content. That's kind of obvious. The other one is much less talked about, at least um, for Drupal. And we call that the, the Q pattern. Um, queues are a vital component in the land of microservices. Everything is connected, or almost everything, is connected with each other uh, very often via queues. And basically, a queue system looks, is very simple. You have a producer that produces some data and adds it to a queue. These messages are queued there until a consumer, at the right time, fetches the data, processes it, and does something, does something uh, with that data. Now, how does this look like in, in, in Drupal? Why, how, where do we use this? Um, an example is an email list subscription. We have a producer, uh, which will be our email sign-up form, would be a custom um, form. And we have a queue that every time somebody adds an email to that email sign-up form, it gets uh, a message gets added to the queue, including the email address, maybe a template ID, maybe some more data. And a consumer will eventually, at, his, uh, at the right time, pick up the data and do something with it. In this case, this might be a custom app. You might want to experiment with a Node.js app, or it might be uh, a Symfony console command tool, or anything that, that the team that wants to do something with that data is comfortable with using. And that would take the data and talk to uh, to MailChimp, for example. So this is, this is, in essence, a way for you to avoid using a module like MailChimp or um, any other direct, uh, direct uh, email module within Drupal. Um, and you kind of really separate two things uh, from each other. Um, this is great because you can now swap out your email provider for something else at a later time, and you wouldn't even have to touch uh, your Drupal code base. Um, so this is a kind of a recap slide, my final slide. Uh, how does our platform ecosystem look like? What kind of website, websites have we uh, spun up using our product code base that you see at the top? And currently, we're running uh, rednosday.com on that code base. Uh, rednosday.org as well, which is the US campaign, is also using that same code base. And we're kind of refactoring all our other editorial websites as we go. And we hope to finish this up in the, in the next couple of months. This is a little slide. Please join the sprints. Um, Drupal is nothing without the contributed code. And thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please come to the mic. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned you are using config devel for breaking up the configuration. I'm wondering how you're doing that and what purpose that serves. Um, we're using config devel to kind of um, slice our configuration uh, on a kind of a feature level much the same way as you would do it in Drupal 7. So you would put a view mode, you would put your content type, um, you would put your fields all manually together into a, a module uh, using config devel. Um, and then it's, it's kind of a way for us to slice up our configuration for our distribution. There's many different ways. Um, we kind of took this idea from AGOF, which is a fantastic uh, Drupal distribution. Uh, but there's many other ways you can manage this as well. There's a lot of helper modules being written right now. This kind of works for now for us, but we might swap it out for something else in the future. Thank Thanks. you.